Sadon Rafaela has certainly made his mark on the Boston Red Sox, and now, as a result, he's here in Boston to stay. You are Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome to Locked On Red Sox, your daily Boston Red Sox podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Gabby Hurlbut, former ESPN social media associate and current host of the Boston Balling Podcast, and I am here to bring you the latest in all things Boston Red Sox, Monday through Friday, straight to your favorite podcast feed for free. And who doesn't love free, right? Anything that's free might as well take advantage. So you might as well start your day off the right way and check out Locked On Red Sox. Locked On is your team every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Thank you for tuning in to Locked on Red Sox. And the home opener is officially here. I'm so excited to just see Fenway Park on my TV. I wish I could have gone to the home opener, but unfortunately I will not be able to make it. But I will be watching every single pitch. And I'm so excited. Beautiful weather today. And I just hope that everybody has a great experience for the first home game of the season. And the Red Sox are coming into it with a very good record right now. And some very exciting news about a young prospect. So I'm going to be talking about that on today's show, as well as previewing a little bit about what to expect in that home opener. The Boston Red Sox have extended Sadon Rafaela. He has made a huge impact so far in his short stint up in the majors in Boston. So far this year, he's taken 30 at-bats and recorded seven hits to the tune of a batting average of 233. He's also scored five runs and stolen one base and recorded five RBIs. He has an on-base percentage of 286 and a slugging percentage of 400 with an OPS of 686. One big thing that stands out about Sadam Rafaela, his athleticism, his speed. He can steal bases effectively. He can stand in the outfield and cover a lot of ground because he has those wheels on his legs and he's able to move quickly to go after baseballs that are hit deep into the outfield. He made the, a really nice catch in the 11th inning in the Red Sox win against the A's last weekend. He ran for the ball and I honestly thought that it was going to go over the fence. I thought it was going to be a walk-off home run by the A's. I was expecting a gut-wrenching loss, but instead he made a great catch at the fence and it won the game for the Red Sox. And he's made some other very nice plays too. He made a diving catch earlier on in the season. He moves his body around accordingly to a lot of different areas of the outfield to make those plays defensively. So he certainly has been a defensive standout so far. One thing that he's improving on and getting better with that he lacked last year was his play discipline. He wanted to swing at every pitch that he saw, and that was something I wanted to see going into this season that he does a little bit better with, and he certainly has showcased that this year and showcased that he has the ability to recognize pitches when they come and be able to say, okay, I should or I should not be swinging at this. So I like that that's improved for him. And obviously the Red Sox see something very special in him. So they have extended him. They've signed him to an eight-year, $50 million deal. And I'll tell you, this is going to look like such a bargain If he pans out to be what the Red Sox want him to be, he's contracted through 2031. There's a lot of potential for him. Obviously, people can say it's too soon to tell how he's going to be as a player, which is completely 100% fair. I do get that, and I do agree with that. There's still a lot of time left to see what kind of player he's going to be. Small sample size completely. We haven't seen a ton from him, but... 
something that's natural about him that won't go away is that athleticism. If somebody has the speed and the ability to get to all parts of the field, that doesn't just disappear. So there is definitely some natural ability in there for him to get to all parts of the field. And also the fact that he can play in both the infield and the outfield, I think is something that the Red Sox really value. Because it's nice for them to have a player who can be flexible and can move around to various parts of the field and be put in the outfield, be put in the infield when there's injuries and not feel like he has to compensate or make up for the lack of a presence of somebody else. So if he's naturally able to switch between those two positions in the infield and in the outfield evenly, that's something he definitely has going for him. So one thing that this is going to really benefit the Red Sox for is that they've now locked up a player who has made very quick strides in the Boston Red Sox organization, worked his way up pretty quickly. And not only was he really hyped up in the minors, but now he's applying himself in the majors and making improvements to last year. And we can only hope that he's going to continue to improve in that manner. And the fact that they dished out what they did, $50 million spread over eight years, is really not that bad in the grand scheme of things. This is great work by Craig Breslow because if he turns into an absolute superstar, this is looking like a great deal for Boston. I know that there is a lot of potential there in him, and I know he's the type of player who could be a core piece of the outfield moving forward. And if you think about the Red Sox right now, they are trying to formulate what their future is going to look like in the outfield. Is it going to be Abreu? Is it going to be Rafaela? Is it going to be Duran? Is it going to be Tyler O'Neill? Or is O'Neill a temporary solution? They're really trying to figure out what that core of the outfield is going to look like moving forward. And to me, Rafaela is somebody who should be one of those pieces for a very long time. Now, when it comes to this deal, if he starts declining or isn't exactly panning out to be the player that the Red Sox are hoping that he could be, if he keeps his value up high enough, then they could try to trade him later on because even if they have to take on some of the salary, it's not that much money really that it'll set them back a lot. And if there's another team that wants to trade for him and they're willing to take on more of the salary, then maybe they do that as well. So this kind of works out for the Red Sox in that it's almost low risk, high reward. Great deal for a player whose ceiling is super high. And now they know that when he enters his prime, the Red Sox will have him during his prime. So that's a great way for them to go about business with these players. And you know what it tells me? that they really truly are trying to invest in the players they feel are worth it because they just recently extended Brian Bayo. Now they sit here and they extend Sadam Rafaela, a player who they see as a cornerstone player for the future. And the next one I want to see them extend is Tristan Casas. I feel like that one's coming soon. So now the narrative of the Red Sox don't want to spend money all of a sudden is looking more like they are willing to spend money if it's a player that they feel is worth investing in. And the Red Sox seem like they're in the mode now of really trying to formulate and build what that core is going to be. When Roman Anthony eventually comes up to play in the outfield, is it going to be an outfield that consists of Duran, Rafaela, and Anthony? When Kyle Teal comes up, what's the catching situation going to look like? When Marcelo Meyer comes up, what's going to happen with Trevor Story? I think they are very much focused on outlining their core, knocking in some of those key positions so that when that big three that is in the Boston Red Sox minor league system right now eventually comes up to the majors, they will be considered those cornerstone players who will be playing with Sadam Rafaela and Rafael Devers. And when you look at players like Brian Bayo, he's a great pitcher and he still is improving. He still has things to prove as a pitcher. But again, another player who, when he's in his prime, will be in a Boston Red Sox uniform. And when the Red Sox are thinking about the future, they're thinking of, okay, Rafaela is a player that we see being a key portion 
of our future. And it also shows me that Willier Abreu could be on his way out. Maybe there's not as much of a place for him on the Red Sox roster anymore. So maybe they try to move him now when it makes sense because they don't see him as a piece to the puzzle moving forward. This is huge for Rafaela's confidence. It shows him that the Red Sox have faith in him and they believe in him to get the job done and to be a go-to guy that the Red Sox can count on day in and day out. So hopefully that helps increase his confidence moving forward when he's at the plate for the rest of this season and beyond so that he can get to the point where he becomes is one of the best players in the league because the potential is definitely there he looks good he looks locked in so far this year and i'm excited to see more of what he can bring to the table moving forward coming up i'm going to be discussing the start to the season so far of a pitcher who gives us an absolute adventure every time he's on the mound but somehow always manages to get the job done so that's coming up next are you ever in a last minute pinch and looking for tickets to anything if so, game time is the way to go. There was this one time where I was having a really frustrating experience with buying tickets. I was trying to figure out if the seats were good because you know at Fenway how you can be blocked by poles and not always be able to have the best view of home plate. And none of the ticket vendors that I was going to were showing me where my seats actually were. And I wanted to make sure I could get a good view of the Red Sox game. So I headed to game time. They showed me exactly where I would be sitting in my view from that seat. So I would know it wasn't an obstructed view and it made it worth it for me. And the best part about it was it was also cheaper than other ticket vendors. So that's something that is good about game time is they always find the less expensive prices for you and the best tickets for you to be able to enhance your ticket buying experience. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. For a limited time, all users can get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the game time app with code first pitch. Terms apply. That's code F-I-R-S-T P-I-T-C-H for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. It really is the guaranteed lowest price and I promise you, you will not regret it. So you should head to Game Time today and use code LOCKEDONMLB. Also, you should head to Locked On Sports today, a free 24-7 sports streaming channel programmed for you every day to bring you the biggest stories in sports. If you're watching Fox Sports or ESPN on your TV all day and have to turn down the volume with all of that shouting, you can make that switch today and it'll give you all the biggest stories minus all that screaming. Locked On Sports today brings you can't-miss analysis, opinions, and news. Streaming 24-7 on YouTube or the free Amazon Fire TV channels app. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It's great for Locked On because no other network has a free 24-7 sports streaming channel. So check it out today. The Boston Red Sox have an established closer in Kenley Jansen. And this season has been very interesting for him. During spring training, he did suffer a bit of an injury and wasn't sure if he was going to be able to pitch going into the season because he did miss some spring training games. So because of that, the Red Sox were unsure if he would be healthy for opening day. He was able to pitch a little bit towards the end of spring training and it allowed for him to come into the season ready to go for opening day but it's always a roller coaster when he pitches he has a 0.00 era so far this season because he still has not given up a run over the four games that he's pitched he's recorded three saves in four innings total he struck out six batters but if you watch some of the innings that he's pitched you would never believe that those were all scoreless innings because he does not have the same power and velocity that he had before. It's definitely down a little bit. He's averaging about 92 to 93 miles an hour when he used to be able to hit 98 to 100. So his pitches are definitely slower than they've been in the past. And his command has not always fully been there. But at the end of the day, he's still closing out games and getting the job done. And that's exactly what you want out of your closer. Now with the Boston Red Sox, there was a lot of talk about them 
trading him during the offseason, seeing what kind of package they could get in return for him. And I wondered if they were going to end up actually pulling the trigger on that and moving him elsewhere. That didn't happen. They kept him. And ultimately, at the end of the day, he is the closer. And I think they felt like there's nobody better to close out games than our established closer, who's a Hall of Fame pitcher. So I don't really blame them for not moving him. I would have had a hard time feeling confident in somebody else closing games unless it was maybe Chris Martin because closing games takes a special kind of pitcher. Very little room for error. You have to pitch on point and you have to look good when you're out there or else you're going to blow the game for your team. So he has a lot less room for error than starters do, for example. And the mental capacity and stamina that it takes to be a closer in Major League Baseball is very tough. And Kenley's one of the best to ever do it. Now, he's nearing the end of his career. There's a possibility this is his last year. But I love the energy he still brings when he's out there. And I'd like to see him try to get his velocity up a little bit more as the season progresses. Because right now, it's working out for him. He's able to get the runners out and get out of the innings when the Red Sox have him out there. High leverage situations, too. But if his velocity isn't able to increase a little bit, he will start to struggle against some of the better offenses in baseball. And I think he's been able to get away with it, partly because the Red Sox have played the A's and the Angels, not super competitive offenses. So when they start playing teams in their own division and there's competitive lineups that the Red Sox are going up against, I could see it being an issue that he doesn't have the same level of velocity that the Red Sox would like him to have right now because he needs to be able to continue to close out games and get the job done. I also do wonder if he's going to be able to stay healthy as the season progresses because he has had some lingering problems lately. And overall, throughout his career, he's been a pretty healthy pitcher. But over the last year or so, he's definitely started to experience some signs of slowing down. And injuries are something that could catch up to him. So I'm hoping that he's able to stay healthy because the Red Sox are going to need him healthy. And if he were to get injured, the question would then be, who would slot into that closing role? And the answer likely is Chris Martin. He was one of the best relievers in baseball last year. He's a very good reliever again this year. And he is the Red Sox eighth inning guy. That is the bridge to Kenley. So I do wonder if he would be the guy that the Red Sox rely on to be in that spot because he's usually a one inning guy who can get the job done in the eighth inning and then send it on to Jansen. So if he were to move into the closing role, who would be the eighth inning guy? And when you're looking at the bullpen right now, there are a variety of candidates who could be in that spot. Isaiah Campbell has been off to a pretty good start in his outings for Boston. Chase Anderson, I'm definitely intrigued by. Definitely has shown some good stuff throwing out of the Red Sox bullpen so far. Justin Slayton is somebody else who the Red Sox brought in this offseason who's an intriguing candidate for that type of role. And obviously Josh Winkowski is interesting too. But Winkowski to me is more better fit to be a 6th or 7th inning type of guy. I don't think he can be trusted as much in those 8th inning high pressure situations. I think he's better off being in more of a middle relief role where he's pitching the middle innings of the game and it's a little bit less pressure on him. I like Winkowski better in that role. But the Red Sox do have options. If Kenley were to get injured and they move Chris Martin into a role where he's closing games, I think that is something the Red Sox could keep in mind. But at the end of the day, they really would have been boxing themselves in if they decided to trade Kenley during the offseason. Because if they did, then the only proven, experienced closer on the roster is no longer here. So then you move a guy in there who's experienced as the eighth inning guy, and then what do you do? Then you just hope that everybody else can fill in accordingly in the other spots. You can't really do that. And at the end of the day, ultimately, Kenley Jansen does make it a roller coaster and an absolute obstacle course when he's out there on the field and it's a lot of ups and a lot of downs but at the end of the day he'll still get the job done and getting the job done is what you need to be a competitive baseball team if the Red Sox are up by a run going into the ninth inning I would be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about Jansen coming in I've said that already a couple times this season is Kenley coming in here is not a comfortable feeling for me, but he's gotten it done every single time, and that's what the best closers do. They move through adversity, they make it work, and they get the job done. So I'm still high on Kenley Jansen overall. 
he's definitely a little bit shaky and I feel like a blown save is definitely something that is bound to happen at some point soon because he does not have his best stuff anymore at this point in his career the velocity being down is definitely something to still continue to note but overall at the end of the day when it comes down to closing out a baseball game and shutting down the opposing offense finishing the job Kenley is still the guy I want out there to close that game so I still believe in him. Hopefully the Red Sox can work with him so that he can elevate his game a little bit more to the point where he can pitch effectively for the rest of this season. But I do wonder if the Red Sox decide to trade him at some point during this season, if they feel like he would be done after this season or would try to be a free agent. Or if they feel like they don't really need him anymore after this year because they're going to try to bring somebody else into that role to fill it, then maybe they try to trade him. But the problem is his value is not super high right now until he starts to have more outings like this. If he has more outings where, yes, he's giving up some base runners, but he's still getting the job done and shutting it down every time, then there will be teams out there that might need a veteran closer just as a loan essentially a player that is a rental that they can use for a potential playoff run so the option is there to still to trade him later on in the season or the Red Sox keep him because ultimately he is their closer and a guy they can rely on on a daily basis to hopefully go in there and continue to get the job done we'll see though and coming up the Red Sox home opener is here. I'm going to be sharing some exciting stuff that you could expect to see at that home opener if you are going to Fenway Park. Prize Picks is a great way to play daily fantasy sports. It's America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick more or less on two or more player stats and watch the winnings roll in. Prize Picks has something for every sports fan, from baseball and basketball to League of Legends and everything in between. You can pick LeBron, Shohei Otani, Connor McDavid, and Jude Bellingham, all in the same entry. Quick withdrawals, easy gameplay, and an enormous selection of players and stat types are what make Prize Picks the number one fantasy sports app. Prize Picks is so much fun. You can select a variety of different players. Just download the app today and use code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. That's a first deposit match up to $100 if you use code locked on MLB. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. It truly is so simple and you won't regret it. So if you want to have some fun and play daily fantasy sports, Prize Picks is the place to do that. Also, Locked On Sports Today is the first ever national sports 24-7 streaming channel. It's available on YouTube and also on Amazon Fire TV in the free Fire TV channels app. Locked On Sports Today is here for you 24-7, covering the top sports stories of the day with the local experts of Locked On, plus our national shows covering every league. Find Locked On Sports Today now available in the free Fire TV channels app. This is so exciting for the network because nobody else has this. So if you are looking for a free 24-7 sports streaming channel, Locked On Sports Today is the place for you. The Boston Red Sox have finally made it to their home opener at 2.10 p.m. Today is first pitch. It's very exciting. I feel like it's been forever since the Red Sox have played a game at Fenway, made it through a very long West Coast trip, and now have definitely earned their spot in their home opener it's going to be a special day it's their 124th home season their 113th at Fenway Park they will open the game with first pitch at 2 10 p.m against the Baltimore Orioles they will start with ceremonies marking the 20th anniversary of the 2004 World Series championship and featuring close to 40 members of the championship team the ceremonies will also honor the memory of members of the Red Sox who have passed with special tributes to Red Sox Hall of Famer Tim Wakefield and his wife Stacy, and former Red Sox president and CEO Larry Lucino, who unfortunately did just pass away last week. Very sad. He was an absolute legend for the game. Just changed the game of baseball and was just a really, really strong figure 
in the Red Sox baseball world. So he will be honored as well. Fans are encouraged to be in their seats by 1.30 p.m. to enjoy the ceremonies. Prior to pregame ceremonies, members of the 2004 championship team will be presented with the reverse to the curse sign by Governor Maura Healy, Mayor Michelle Wu, and DCR Commissioner Brian Arrigo at the Hotel Commonwealth before boarding duck boats en route to Fenway Park. The sign from Storo Drive was famously altered from reverse the curse to reverse the curse when the Red Sox won the World Series championship, ending that 86-year drought. In addition to the family of Tim and Stacey Wakefield, confirmed members attending the 2004 championship team reunion include Jimmy Anderson, Bronson Arroyo, Jamie Brown, Orlando Cabrera, Cesar Crespo, Johnny Damon, Brian Daubach, Lenny DiNardo, Keith Folk, Terry Francona, Bill Hasselman, Adam Hisdu, Ron Jackson, Gabe Kapler, Kurt Laskanik, Derek Lowe, Mark Malaska, Dave McCarty, Ramiro Mendoza, Doug Meadkewix, Kevin Millar, Brad Mills, Mike Myers, Trot Nixon, David Ortiz, Manny Ramirez, Calvin Reese, Phil Siebel, Earl Snyder, Dale Sfium, Mike Timlin, Jason Veritek, Dave Wallace, Scott Williamson, and Kevin Euclid. Lots of people are going to be there. If you are attending, you will get to see all these guys on the field pregame for the ceremonies. It's going to be cool also because every fan attending the game will receive a special Wakefield commemorative pin as well as a 2024 season schedule magnet. So lots going on. It'll be a really special day for Red Sox Nation with that 20 years since the 2004 Red Sox team. Lots of legends in the building. And one of those legends that could be a legend in the future is Brian Bayo, who will be starting on the mound for the Red Sox on the day. Going against Corbin Burns, who the Orioles traded for this offseason, has a 1-0 record and 231 ERA so far. Brian Bayo has a record of 1-0 and a 540 ERA. His last start in Oakland was not the best, so he's looking to bounce back from that. He'll have to have a great start to match up with Corbin Burns. I'm hoping that the Red Sox pitching can do their job and keep the scoring low like they've been doing on the road trip. This is going to be a test for them. Coming off of a season in which they won the division and won 100 games, the Orioles are definitely in great shape to repeat as division winners. So this is going to be the first real test for the Boston Red Sox in terms of ability level is where are they at compared to the rest of their division? Are they at a level where they can compete with Baltimore or are they still a level behind everybody else? This is going to be a series where we can really tell where the Red Sox truly are at. And that's going to start with the pitching because we know this offense has been off to a good start. They will hit, they will score some runs. It's just a matter of where are they at relative to everybody else? So I'm anxious to see Brian Bayo go out there, pitch at home again, and pitch in a daytime start because he struggled a lot in daytime starts last year. So has Andrew Bailey been able to figure out how to fix him so that he pitches better during the day? So that's another storyline I'm watching out for in the Red Sox home opener. It's a game where the Red Sox are going to need to try to get Corbin Burns's pitch count up early on so that he gets pulled from the game quicker because he is a great pitcher and the Red Sox might have trouble scoring runs and might have trouble getting to him. But if they can generate some early swings, even if they're fouling balls off and they can try to work the pitch count, that's something that will give them a good opportunity later on. If he gets out of the game on the earlier side and the Orioles have to turn to their bullpen, that will be a good way for the Red Sox to be able to win the game. And the Red Sox have the lineup to do it. They have hitters who will work pitchers counts and will be there. They're very disciplined as an overall lineup and they will be able to get pitchers out of games early if they are playing their best baseball. So that's something that's good about the Red Sox lineup that I'm hoping to see in today's game. Welcome to the home opener. I'm so excited to see what the Red Sox do so much to be excited about after a very strong road trip for Boston in which they came back with only three losses on the season so far. So hopefully they can continue their winning ways. Hopefully they can stack up well against Baltimore because if they struggle a lot in this series, it shows that they are still a step behind them. 
So going against a very good Orioles team, we'll see how things go. But as always, like I always say, you have to keep the faith. It's the only way to make the world go round, right? As always, go Red Sox. Enjoy the beautiful weather and the home opener. And I will catch you on the flip side.